Hey everyone, uh, before we get going today, wanted to touch on the uh, serious part before we do all the music and the graphics and everything. Uh, felt like that would be a little out of place. Obviously the big news of the day involving the 2018 World Junior Hockey Championship team for Team Canada on the men's side. Uh, Rick Westhead tweeting out uh, the bombshell today. Uh, this coming out at uh, 7.38 Mountain Time saying five members of the 2018 World Junior Hockey team have been told to surrender to London, Ontario police to face charges of sexual assault. The Globe and Mail reports, uh, citing unnamed sources. The Globe reports the players, who have not been charged yet, have been given a set period of time to present themselves at London Police Headquarters. Uh, Robin Doolittle also doing um, a, a tremendous job reporting on this particular story. And um, obviously that this has been a long, long, long time coming. And... Um, it shows a number of different things. Obviously, it shows the difficulty of bringing a case like this to court and all the difficulties that that, that this presents, um, both for the uh, survivor of this attack as well as uh, just the, the, the uh, judicial system in general. It can be a, a difficult challenge putting these sorts of things together, and that is absolutely a system that needs to be changed. And also the reaction to a lot of this throughout the entire process has shown how desperately hockey culture needs to change. And whether it's boys will be boys or some of the other just horrific things that have been used to to either defend or just straight up um, absolve anyone before any shred of evidence comes out, um, it, it just it really shows that there is a reckoning that still needs to happen in this country, in, 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 in this sport, not just in this country, but in this sport and in the, the sports landscape in general, where how well you play a certain sport dictates the leniency that you get in certain situations and the benefit of the doubts that are, are um, I guess, undeservedly given to, to some. So this is a big day, hopefully, that this... Um, the, the, the correct verdict comes out, whatever that may be, um, justice is served to the fullest extent, whatever that may include, and we get actual real understanding here, and yeah, just ho hopefully justice is served is probably the best way to, to, to put this whole thing. So that's all I'm going to say on the matter right now. Uh, I'm going to, well, we're going to take a bit of a pause and then we are going to get into the music and the graphics and the fun stuff until the end when I, I get serious again, so sorry, but that's, um, that's all I have to say about that. So, um, yeah, continue to, to stay locked on social media. Uh, just one more thing. Rick Westhead has been an absolute superstar in the reporting of all of this. And there have been others as well, but Rick Westhead has been at the, the forefront of this in a number of different situations. And that type of journalism, um, is absolutely invaluable. And hopefully that sort of thing continues even as the, the world at large loses those positions across the globe. So, um, brief little bleh, and then uh, we'll get on with the show. To Couch Potato Diary on this Wednesday. My name is Peter Klein. Thank you very much for tuning in today. If you are watching on YouTube, make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you are listening in podcast form, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. That stuff always really does help and is always greatly appreciated. Coming up on the show today, we look at the Calgary Flames uh, with a diary entry on uh, their game from a night ago. Uh, we also look at the Super Bowl um, as we get ready for NFC and AFC Championship weekend, looking at the best possible Super Bowl matchups that we could possibly get. It's always controversial. The Baseball Hall of Fame vote uh, went down. I'll discuss uh, with a little bit of baseball news and notes as well. Uh, as always, follow me on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. I'm at PrimetimeKlein, twitch.tv slash PrimetimePK, and you can email the show, Diary at yahoo.com. All right, let's get into it. Looking at the Calgary Flames game last night against the St. Louis Blues.
Okay, so uh, Calgary taking on the Blues. This is going to be, uh, I, I didn't have the official graphic on it. I'm working on a new one, to be perfectly honest. Um, but th this is going to be kind of in diary entry form, where I just go kind of blow by blow through this game and give my thoughts. I take notes on every game I've ever watched uh, for the last, like, ten years. And uh, just going to lay out what I saw from this one today. So we will start. It's the Blues against the Flames coming to you from Scotiabank Saddle Dome on January 23rd, 2024. Um, the St. Louis Blues going with Jordan Bennington in goal, making his seventh start in his last nine games played. He has been better as the, this season has gone along and a bit of a stabilizing force, allowing the Blues to get back into the playoff hunt. For the Calgary Flames, it's Jacob Markstrom back after missing three games, uh, seven and three in his last 10 starts. Uh, the game begins and almost right away Markstrom is tested as Saad comes in on a chance, gets a great look and a very good save from Jacob Markstrom. That's going to be a common theme throughout this breakdown. Then Hayes gets a chance off of a Gilbert turnover. That gets stopped as well. Just a failed clearing attempt by Gilbert. Um, but again, things that will come up later. Gilbert having a bit of a tough time with the puck. The Flames cause havoc of their own as Schwint gets a, an opportunity off of the forecheck and uh, he gets a chance stopped. Th this was his um, first game with the Flames this season. I thought he looked pretty good. Like, the, the, the we'll, we'll get to the Rosichka news here in a little bit, but I, I thought he looked very effective in a, a fourth-line centering role, and I thought he and Greer and Gla uh, Klapka were a fun mix together, and I, I would love to see that again kind of work its way through. So, I, I think an, an interesting uh, an interesting group, and I, I thought they did exactly what you want a fourth line to do. They, they created some opportunities with a forecheck, and it didn't feel like they were hemmed in their own end all that much. Back on the, the blue side, Buchnevich gets a, a great chance off of a nice pass down low. The Blues were really good at working from behind the net and then doing a low to high. Whether that high was only a little bit higher, in this case which uh, with Buchnevich in front, or if it was on a, a pass to the, the blue line, setting up an opportunity there. Either way, it was a, a very strong... Um, very, very, very strong part of the Blues game was the speed that they were able to, to to play with and the opportunities they were able to create playing from down low. And Buchnevich was kind of quiet in this game, actually. He comes up uh, in a second here, actually right away. He does a, a nice drop pass to Falk, who lets go an absolute, uh, to, to quote Jim Houston in the video games, an absolute howitzer. And that, that creates uh, another scoring opportunity there. But Buchnevich is certainly an interesting player. And someone whose skill set I like a lot, but quiet in this game for sure. Uh, Krug gets another good chance, um, and they are getting some some grade A looks coming off of that low to high situation and getting some good opportunities coming from the blue line. The Flames um, don't make life easier for themselves as Schwint then takes a penalty. This was just a kid trying to do too much. The puck's coming back to Anderson at the blue line. He is there with a bit of space. It's not going to be an easy play for him, but he's going to be there with a chance to make a one on one move and create maybe an opportunity and a, at least a bit more zone time for this team. Instead, Schwint is just trying to uh, uh, beat too hard and does one of those like elbow shouldery type of swim moves to try to get around the guy and um, it, successful, super interference, but he did it. Um, so that, that leads to a power play for the St. Louis Blues that was pretty pedestrian until the last few moments. And then Hayes gets a great chance in front. Um, and Markstrom makes a phenomenal save. Markstrom was excellent to start this game and helping keep the flames in it. So that this is already, I would say three to four grade A high danger chances that they were able to create. And a couple of them aren't going to count as high danger chances because they weren't in the right area, but uh, Falcon Krug hit the fuck out of the puck and <laughs> gave them opportunities. And Markstrom stood tall, making uh, making the save. And then um, Hayes almost gets a steal again on a dangerous Tanev pass. And this was something, and it'll come up again throughout the game, the Flames were extremely sloppy and just careless with the puck. And I, I think, uh, with all due respect to the St. Louis Blues, if they do that against a uh, a team of greater danger, whether it be a Vancouver or an Edmonton or a Toronto, um, or even like Vegas, Colorado, you know, you know the good teams. If they do that against them, Calgary's down like 5 nothing after this first period. They played a little bit abysmal in the first half of this game. But then things start to turn around. Um, Huberto walks out in front. He gets a chance that stopped. He's been playing better, obviously, with points in, um, uh, eight points in his last seven games played. And then Uyghur walks in and picks a corner 
perfectly. It is like there was a tracking device on this thing. He found the corner and he put it there. Just an absolute perfect shot, short side. This is a, an automatic goal on, I think it was NHL 11 or 12, um, where if, if you if you could pick that short side, it was a goal 100 times out of 100. And Uyghur is able to, to hit it there. And he does it again. Um, it, it starts with um, good pressure from Nazem Kadri down low. Um, he was out there with, with Huberto and um, I believe it was Coronado, but th they were out there creating some good pressure and that gets the puck to the blue line. Some space for Uyghur. He fires it home. Uyghur's got 11 on the year. Uh, he's got goals in back-to-back -back games and the Flames take a one nothing lead that it didn't totally feel like they deserved. Um, but they kind of kept the pressure on after that. Coronado gets a good shot in tight off of, again, a real good forecheck here by the Calgary Flames. Um, and, and this forecheck was giving what I would consider a pretty good St. Louis Blues decor a significant amount of trouble. There was a lot of, especially early in the game, the Flames were causing a lot of turnovers and just limiting the, the zone exits for the St. Louis Blues, giving Calgary either an easier time defensively or more offensive zone time. And that's kind of how the Flames were able to, to shift this game around and then, spoiler alert, lose it entirely at the end. But that is, that, that's basically how um, the, the Flames were able to, to get things going. Um, Anderson gets a really good point shot and then there's a scramble for the rebound and it just felt like the, the pressure is on here, that the dam could break. But credit to Jordan Bennington. He, he played a, a pretty strong game as well. Credit to both goalies is a weird thing to say in a game that went over the total with seven, but credit both goalies because they, they both played, I, I thought, very good hockey here in this one. Uh, Uyghur gets another good shot, uh, good shot stopped, and th this was where, like, Calgary, they, they were doing just such a good job. After an early push by the Blues, they were pushing back, and in, in a more substantial, dangerous way, I thought, getting a lot of good luff looks after great shift after great shift from the, uh, the, the Nazem Kadri line. And so it, it feels like you're happy with it coming off of back-to-back -back losses against Edmonton and Toronto, but it did feel like going to the break up one nothing wasn't quite enough. They needed, I, I thought, a little bit more from this team. And it, it just, it felt like maybe a bit of a missed opportunity, given the chances they were able to generate in the back part of that period. They start off the second period great again, as the Kadri line gets going. Zari had a fantastic pass that just got tipped wide. They keep control and get another chance off of it. And they're, they're really starting to, to put the pressure on. And then it comes to a screeching halt. And this is, I, I thought Marchand was excellent. Not entirely blameless in what ends up being a Calgary Flames 4-3 loss at the hands of the St. Louis Blues. Um, I thought that the Flames did a lot of really, really good stuff, but then Sod comes in, and it's a shot that gets deflected immediately, like basically right from the shot, and it goes in, and... I think sometimes, and it's difficult as, as someone who didn't play the position at, it, at an extremely high level, um, I don't don't think Pee Wee counts, but for, for goalies a lot of the time, if it's deflected at all, it's like, well, I couldn't possibly have stopped it. This one felt like the deflection came from far enough out that Markstrom maybe should have got a piece of that. So you don't love this one from Markstrom, and you don't love this for the Flames because they had everything going in their direction, and then it just stops. And it's a bit of a hint of what happened a season ago with Markstrom. Not all the way with Markstrom, but um, it's a bit of a hint from what happened a season ago where they would have... Um, seem to think like things are starting to come back a little bit and then a bad goal goes in. This just, this had a bit of a tinge of that and uh, Saad gets his 12th. The score is tied now uh, at one. Calgary gets a power play. They do nothing with it. Theme of the game again. But they do get um, a, a pretty good bit of pressure after the power play, the Lindholm line is out there, and they're putting a, a lot on the uh, a lot on the St. Louis Blues. And then Hannafin one timer scores. It's a bit of a, a almost broken play. Pass across to Lindholm. I think got tipped, and it just bounces back. And <laughs> Lindholm's kind of standing there, and it's like, look out! Uh, Hannafin comes in, hammers a one timer home. Um, good read by Hannafin. Good pressure by the Flames. Ends up breaking through, and they quickly get the lead back up two to one. Hannafin now with eight goals. On the season. Um, at this point, the broadcast flashes up a graphic that shows that the St. Louis Blues are 31st in the NHL in scoring uh, per game since November 28th, with I believe it was 1.96 goals a game. Either way, it was under two, um, which is not great, but you would assume, hey, Flames are up two to one. That's, that's the cutoff. So things might turn around. And then 
um, Yegor Sharangovich walks in and an absolute snipe. This kid's shot is a weapon and it gives the Flames a three to one lead. And it, it, you just, you get the feeling that this was a a game that the Flames had in control. Um, then all of a sudden Lindholm gets another chance off of the rush. Um, he draws a slashing penalty and Calgary goes to the power play. And then the scene shifts. As the puck comes back to the blue line, Uyghur has a bit of trouble handling. Uh, Brayden Shen pounces and is gone. And he walks in and scores. Um, it's a brutal turnover for the Flames. A back-breaking goal. Again, the second time this game, they had all the momentum and make a bad play and give it all right back. This Flames team, there's a lot that I like from this game from the Flames, but this Flames team is not good enough to make up for some of the sloppy play that they had in this game. Um, they kind of need to be perfect to beat some of these teams. And they were not perfect on this game, and this was a, another example of this, really highlighting some of the problems that the Flames had in this game. Uh, Shen's 11th, they said on the broadcast, his first career shorthanded goal, um, and it helps the Flames, uh, or it helps the Blues, sorry, make it 3 two um and then a bit of a frustrating one here still in the power play coronado is walking in and he makes one too many moves at the blue line and that ends up drawing an offside and th this was again a kid trying to do too much you have at least gained the zone um basically like th there was enough room for him to get in there but he's trying to make too many moves at the blue line and the timing, especially on zone entries for the Flames, which have been an issue, the timing of this is so important to get those guys going in with speed, and he just made one too many moves, and it gets everyone offside, and it's it's a bit of a drive killer there, but a lesson learned, I, I think, for, uh, for, for Coronado, but a real disappointing close to the period for the Flames, who still hold a 3-2 lead going into the third period, and then the Blues just took over and kind of stole the Flames' lunch money. Uh, Sammy Blaze with a chance walking out in front. He stopped. And then Jordan Cairo walks out in front and scores. The Calgary Flames were absolutely in chase mode. It's another, and I said he was going to come up again, it's another frustrating play from Dennis Gilbert as he was a little bit soft along the wall and the puck gets held into the blue line. That leads to all of the scrambling and then Jordan Cairo getting the opportunity in front. A rare time where the backland line is kind of left chasing a little bit. Um, but anyway, it's a tie game, 3-3. Kairou from Thomas and Letty. Um, I like Kairou as a player a lot, and he and Thomas were just all around it all game. Uh, this was the only time you really noticed Letty in the, the entire operation. Calgary has a chance to get it back. It's two on one. Um, backland waits, 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 and gets the goalie like out of position, throws it in front. It's a wide open net, but there's no one there. Uh, that, that felt like a bit of a missed opportunity for the Flames. St. Louis gets another chance as Jordan Cairo gets a breakaway and he is stopped. So you're just, you're just going through this. It's high danger chance, high danger chance, high danger chance, high danger chance. So many great opportunities for the Blues that were stopped. And that's why I stopped short of blaming Markstrom entirely for this game. Here's another one. Neighbors gets a steal um, and uh, a chance that gets deflected out of play. And Calgary just so sloppy with the puck. Um, they get a power play and nothing happens from it. And this was where I got really frustrated. It is a tie game. There's about five minutes left and you have an opportunity to take a game back that was once yours. And they... They dropped the ball. It was an abysmal power play. There was no urgency to it whatsoever. And then not long after that, saw it on the rush and he scores. And so you have a chance with about five minutes left to take control of the game again. And you kind of piss it away. And then that allows this situation to happen. It's not a good goal on Markstrom. I don't care that it might have been tipped. I don't care whatever, if it was dipping or whatever. This is a bad goal on Jacob Markstrom to allow at that point. And it ends up being the game winner. Saad gets a second of the game, 13 on the year. Blues take it, 4-3. Ends up being the final. The Calgary Flames, quite frankly, were just simply not good enough in this game. And there were stretches where they were really, really good. And I was watching it and I was like, Look, I know this isn't like, oh, the championship team, or probably, honestly, barely even playoff team. But there was a lot to like about this team when it's going well. But then, once that ball starts rolling against them, they have just had nothing to stop it. And a power play is a really good chance to do that, and it ends up giving away momentum a couple of times in this game. And that ends up hurting the, the Flames. So, a lack of urgency... Um, a lack of any kind of control with the puck really costs them. A couple of bad goals for Markstrom, but 
Honestly, and even though he played well against Edmonton, if Ladar's in net, Calgary probably loses this game five or six to two. That's how many great A fantastic chances that the Blues had here that Markstrom just let slip or uh, just bailed them out on. And then a couple slip by, which is really frustrating. But this one is not entirely on Markstrom. He gets a very small part of the blame pie. Um, Gilbert really fought it defensively. Uh, I thought uh, really sloppy with the puck. The whole team was really, really sloppy with the puck. And that led to a number of opportunities for the, the St. Louis Blues. So for the Flames, loss against Toronto, those happen, one of the best teams in the league. Loss against Edmonton, they've almost spent a quarter of the season just winning hockey games, uh, 14 in a row now. Those are going to happen. These can't happen. If you are going to be a playoff team, this is not a game that you should lose. Just a, a really, really difficult loss. And um, Julian McKenzie was on 960 today talking about how, like, yeah, if this was a... Um, if this was a game that even you you just let slip to, to go to overtime feels disappointing. To get no points and they gain two on you is a real, real kick in the teeth. And look, they, they might come back against the Blue Jackets and the Blackhawks and put up a couple of big games and, oh boy, here go the Flames again. But games like this keep happening. And all of that goodwill that's built up over winning those um, the the four straight now gone with three losses at home. Uh, they're one and three on this homestand. Can only now go three and three, and it, it just it feels like even if they, they aren't going the blow up direction, playoffs feel like a, a thing that is fading into the distance for this Calgary Flames team. Uh, just quickly, a couple of roster moves today for the Flames. Adam Ruzicka has been placed on waivers. Nick DeSimone um, along with him. I would be a little bit surprised if either player gets um, picked up. They have both had some flashes, but it, for Ruzicka, it is entirely a consistency thing. He has really, like, he'll, he'll have some spurts where it goes, but th this is a bit of a forced analogy. In NASCAR, sometimes there are guy there. There will be times where a car is better on um, in those short runs, but then the longer you go between like pit stops and the longer you go between yellow flags, and they get kind of a, a sustained run going, the the more that car starts to fade back a little bit. That's what Ruzichka is. Right out of a pit stop, right out of a yellow flag, dude is busting. And he is great. But the longer we're at green flag racing, it doesn't go all that great. Um, so if he can find the consistency, this guy's an NHL for 10 years. Because he has the skill set, he has the size that people dream about. He just can't put it together uh, for three, four, five games in a row. For Simone, there have been some flashes of a player that you really, really like. And this would be one that would be a bit of a bummer if the Flames were to lose him for free. Um, I, I have liked a lot of his game, but... Well, it would be a bit of a, oh, I don't think it is um, an, in such a, a, a devastating loss that you don't do this if you want to call someone else up uh, or if there are, are reinforcements coming. Good news for the Flames. Um, Shillington continues to practice with the team. That is phenomenal news. And uh, Jacob Pelche is uh, apparently going to be starting with the team this week weekend um or with the Wrangler story this weekend so a big boost for Calgary coming uh potentially here soon but um at this point it's not going to matter if they keep playing like that that was a really really frustrating loss for the Flames Let's see if they can turn it around in their next game against the Blue Jackets of Columbus so that is uh the hockey talk there let's get into a little bit of football The Super Bowl is still a couple of weeks away, but Championship Sunday is just a few days away as we get ready for uh, the Baltimore Ravens against the Kansas City Chiefs and the Detroit Lions facing the San Francisco 49ers, which means we have four Super Bowl matchups left. Which ones are the best ones? I'm going to rank them right now. We begin at number four. Um, what would be, and look, I want to say off the hop, all these are dope. Uh, all these are would be really, really fun and a lot of interesting storylines. And the Lions hater in me is absolutely coming out here because uh, coming in at number four is the Detroit Lions against the Baltimore Ravens. Not a whole lot for storylines in there. Cool that Detroit is going to be in this game and um, for the first time ever. And that, that would be neat. For Baltimore, it's Lamar Jackson on, on a big stage. That's fun. That's great. Like, I would be excited for him. Um, but one of these has to be fourth and it would be this one. Coming in at number three. The Detroit Lions against the Kansas City Chiefs. You see where the Detroit hater part is kind of coming out a little bit? Again, 
great for Detroit, but and, and for Kansas City, it gets a bump over Baltimore this year because then we're getting into, oh man, Mahomes, like, this is a lot of Super Bowls that this cat's been in, and now if he can win a third, we're getting into, like, you know, only a couple people have done that ever category, um, so good on you. For, for, for that, and then what we're talking about, Andy Reid is one of the greatest coaches ever. So there's a lot more storylines that go along uh, potentially with that one. At number two, San Francisco against Baltimore. It's a it, it's chalky because it's the top two teams in each conference, and so because of that, they they, they get knocked down just a, a, a touch for me in the rankings. Um, there, there's obviously a whole lot of fun that goes along with this one. It's a rematch in the game when the lights went out. Um, you, you have... Um, Kyle Shanahan looking for his first to really solidify himself as one of the premier coaches of his time. Um, you have Harbaugh looking for his second to really solidify himself as one of the great coaches of his time. Lamar Jackson breakthrough moment. Um, so, like you have the two most talented teams in the league facing each other, which makes it weird that it's two. But at number one, it is San Francisco, Kansas City. It's another Super Bowl rematch uh, for, for, for the 49ers uh, against the Kansas City Chiefs team that they were close against uh, a few years ago, and then Kansas City was able to, to break through. All the storylines on the Kansas City side, with Mahomes going after another championship, Reed going after another championship, Travis and Taylor, obviously, as well. Um, and then on the San Francisco side, again, Shanahan looking to break through. Uh, you have Patrick Mahomes going after the greatest of all time in Tom Brady as the the greatest uh, quarterback ever. If he gets a, a third Super Bowl championship in his fourth appearance, uh, you have Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant, going for a title. So I, I think that one, to me, is probably the most interesting of all of the potential Super Bowls. But either way, we are in for a really, really great championship game. Excuse me, in the National Football League, coming off of what will probably be a really, really great championship Sunday in the NFL. The breakdowns of these games will continue all throughout the week. A little bit more news from the NFL as uh, Joe Barry has been let go as the defensive coordinator of the Green Bay Packers. I was a little bit worried for the Packers that they were going to... Um, that they were going to kind of stick with the status quo to steal a reference from um, High School Musical. Um, but they, they are not just sticking to the stuff you know or following one simple rule. Um, they, they are certainly recognizing that this was an area of weakness see, uh, throughout the season. The, this defense, I, I think, kind of actively let them down. And if that offense gets into maybe a couple of less shootouts and this offense gets the, the ball in maybe a few more advantageous situations, they can really take off. Um, th there are pieces that are needed on the defensive side. I don't think Joe Barry got a full complement of talent all season long. And that became a bit of a problem uh, out there in green Bay as well. But the, the defense needs to be addressed because the offense looks really, really good. But Joe Barry was just, I think pretty consistently outcoached throughout the, the season in the NFL. So we'll see where the green Bay Packers go with this, but this is a, a smart recognition that just because you got to the divisional round doesn't mean tweaks and changes aren't needed. Um, so that is the story from the NFL. Let's get into some baseball talk. The Baseball Hall of Fame um, is going to have three new members as Adrian Beltre, Todd Helton, and Joe Maurer are voted into the Hall of Fame. Um, and so I, I thought today I would give my crack at the Hall of Fame voting. It gets less controversial now. No Bonds, no Clemens on the, the thing. I, I want to state for the record, I think that's absurd. Those are two of the greatest players of their time, regardless of what enhancements. And I, I think to um, re-legislate the, the steroid debate is ridiculous. You had their entire careers to catch them, and you didn't. So they they have made it through. We are now just going off of hearsay. Look, did they take steroids? Probably. Does it matter? Were they suspended for it? No. Well, then clearly baseball didn't have a problem with it then. We shouldn't have a problem with it now. We shouldn't be putting 2024 standards onto something that happened in 1998 or 2001 or 2002. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous! What this is, um, what this whole thing has become—just this whole um, stance for the writers, who a lot of them were complicit at the time, seeing needles in lockers and shit like that. But now, now we're holding up the sanctity of the game. Fuck off! I I hate the debate, and I hate um, illegitimizing what was for me my favorite time as a, a baseball fan. I vividly remember watching with my dad. 
um, the, the home run chase and all of the opportunities because it was getting like national play. And the, the weekend that I'm pretty sure I might be putting a couple of things together, but the weekend, no, it was the weekend before, um, the, the Maguire versus Sosa game that got broadcast everywhere. My, my, my parents splurged and we got a new TV and we were able to, to, to go home, get the new TV all hooked up basically like it was out of a movie as soon as we turn it on and flip over to the the game you you see mark mcguire hitting home run number 61 into uh into the the big mac section in left field for the the st louis cardinals and then i remember gathered around the tv watching mcguire hitting home run number 62 um and the, the joe buck call is it enough gone um and so to, to now, oh, well, uh, actually that, that entire era didn't count. Everyone was cheating. Like, again, fuck all of you. Every, if everyone was cheating, no one was cheating. So if we were fine with it then, you have to be fine with it now. You, you had your opportunity to catch them, and you didn't. So, tough, man. Um, but when you see what's going on uh, around the world in other things, and this is what we're getting held up on, fuck off. Um, so with that criteria being said, I have made my Hall of Fame of, uh, ballot here for 2024. Now, I am not a big Hall guy, which will seem absurd because of all of the people who I'm putting on my Hall of Fame ballot. So I will start with the three that made it in. They get in for me still. Adrian Beltre, um, Todd Helton, and Joe Maurer. Beltre was such a consistent force, especially in the back part of his career. Bit of a rough time. Um, when he went kind of, we went from the Dodgers to the Mariners that it, it seemed like that was kind of the end of it. And then he goes to Texas and completely turns that franchise around. And all he became was a reliable defender and a reliable bat in the middle of some really good orders. And this becomes, I mean, he's a first ballot hall of famer, so it's tough to say, well, there's doubt on it, but this becomes an absolute no doubter. If Adrian Beltre and the, the Rangers are able to win one of those World Series that they came oh so close to winning um, in the, the early 2010s. But because like this guy was just consistently 30 home runs, consistently a really good defender and just a great ambassador for the sport, Adrian Beltre gets it. Todd Helton, a lot of people are going to say a lot of these stats are inflated by Coors. If you're not going to allow guys in because of the stats at their home ballpark, don't have that team. Like, if it is okay for the Colorado Rockies to have a team and play in that ballpark, then it's okay for those stats to count and to, to get it going. Like John Jaskremski said on the New York, New York podcast this week, do you discredit left-handed hitters um, at Yankee Stadium for those home runs? No. Um, do you discredit guys who played in the National League East who got to play 9, 10 games a season beating up on the Rockies? No. It's the beautiful thing about baseball is that all these stadiums are different in their own way. And Todd Helton... Would have put up monster numbers anywhere. You put him in Detroit, that guy is balling out. He was that good of a hitter the entirety of his career. And so he gets that one. And for Joe Maurer, the counting stats aren't great. And we're going to have to kind of relook at how we think of those from a catcher standpoint. Because they kind of get the crap beat out of them. But he just felt like an automatic base hit all the time. Defensively, he was what he was. But... As a um, quote-unquote professional hitter, he was the best of the best. Uh, an unbelievable approach to, to hitting and a, a fantastic eye. Just as automatic as automatic comes. So th this is the one where I was a little bit, yeah. But yeah, one of the best catchers of his time for a long time. You'll take it. Absolutely. Um, I think... This is where now I extend my ballot from those who, who were uh, on. Billy Wagner should be in the Hall of Fame. If if we are going to have this era of closers, he was one of the best at it. And just an absolute lockdown guy. No matter what team he was on, it felt like they were always in contention. He was so dominant. And so dominant um, as a lefty as well to come in and really just shut dudes down. This was a, a phenomenal, phenomenal showing. From uh, from Billy Wagner, his entire career, he deserves there. Gary Sheffield, this is one. Did he? He, he was named in the Balco stuff. Did he get suspended? No. Nope. Got to put him in. Those are Hall of Fame numbers. Uh, such a feared hitter. A batting stance with the. Um, I, I don't have any of the plastic bats or the wooden bats that we have in here, but that the bat waggle coming in, and then his, his load up and the launch, and just hitting the hell out of baseballs always. Such a feared hitter. What, like just the last guy you wanted to see in any situation. One of the best power hitters in an era full of them. 
for whatever reason. Um, he he stood out amongst all of them. So I, I think he absolutely deserves to be in. It is a damn shame that he is now off of the ballot as this was his 10th crack at it. So um, the, the Veterans Committee now is the last chance for Gary Sheffield to get in to the Hall of Fame. I put Andrew Jones in. One of the best defensive center fielders in the history of the game who also hit 400 home runs. The batting average uh, wasn't always spectacular, and there was certainly a bit of a fall off at the end. But in his prime, maybe the best, uh, like, th there's a couple of guys you could put alongside. Like, Torrey Hunter um, could have been on there, or, or, or certainly up there as well, and then you get Griffey and you know, Mays and those guys. But on the Mount Rushmore, I think, for defensive center fielders in the history of the sport, and then 400 home runs on Atlanta Braves teams that were competitive and dangerous, um... I don't know how you keep th this guy out of the Hall of Fame, given how well he played uh, a defensive center field and then the power numbers that follow as well. Carlos Beltran, I get that there is some punishment for the Houston Astros situation. And this is the one where if you don't want to let him in, then don't, um, because he was literally punished for something um, in cheating the game. It wasn't, I mean, it, it kind of was as a player, I guess, but as a player, he is Hall of Fame worthy one of the best players for a really long time in the sport and uh, buried a little bit in Kansas City, then goes to the bright lights of the Mets and delivers immediately and delivers for the Houston Astros immediately. Just legitimately one of the best players of his era. And I, I, I think even like, obviously he's not in the Hall of Fame, which makes him underrated. Anything short of the Hall of Fame underrates the career of Carlos Beltran. I do put Andy Pettit in, and this is a little bit of he just got to play for the Yankees. If Andy Pettit was a Blue Jay, I don't know if he gets the, the same attention, but because he is pitching in the World Series every year, and look, he is a big part of why the Yankees were pitching, uh, had the opportunity to pitch him in the World Series every year, but one of the dominant lefties of his generation, he does get tangled up in the, the steroid thing, so if you do want to, to keep him out, um, then then I suppose you, you could. Um, and actually, now that I'm saying this, I might be, uh, I might be being a bit hypocritical. I didn't think he was, was he actually suspended for it? If he is, then I, I, by my rules, I do have to, to keep him out, uh, just to, to, to stay fair. Um, so let's just, of course, now my keyboard is picking this time to not being, uh, to, to not connect here, but, um, oh, this is so frustrating that it's not connecting for me here, but for, for Andy Pettit, yeah, I'm just going to use my phone. For Andy Pettit, sorry, this is really bad podcasting. He was, again, one of the dominant left-handers of his time. And any, like, clutch or big situation, he was just the best at always. And so just on merit, you, I think, have to put him in. There is always going to be the steroid scandal uh, around this particular player. And that is always going to be a bit of a, a black mark on him, but I do think you, I do think you have to kind of look at this guy as one of the greats to, to ever do it, especially as a, a left-handed pitcher for, uh, for some dominant New York Yankees teams. Um, okay. Uh, September 30th, 2006, the LA times, uh, da, 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 da. there's a lot here. Pettit was one of several names named in the Mitchell report. Um, Pettit verified McNamee's claim admitting to using HGH on two occasions in 2002. He denied further use of HGH during his career. He also denied the use of performance enhancers. Um, he apologized to fans. So I don't believe he was ever fully suspended. And so that is my cutoff. Like, yes, he used it, but if he didn't get suspended, then it wasn't, uh, it's a weird cutoff for me, but if baseball punished them for him, then I can punish him for it. If they didn't, then it's not that they, I, I have lost the right to do it. So Pettit gets in. Glad all of that horrible podcasting covered that up. And finally, I am putting K-Rod in. An electric closer, and again, if we are putting closers in, which we should, because they, they became a very valuable part of the sport, especially during K-Rod's run, he was, again, one of the best at it. It fell off quick, and so longevity does hurt him a little bit, but at his peak, he was one of the best to do it. So, K-Rod gets in. A couple quick news and notes. Um, uh, Trey Mancini signing a minor league deal with the Marlins. This is the exact type of move I would have loved the Blue Jays to try. Um, really good bat. 
so-so fielder, but a, a guy who could run into a couple. And just the, the type of bat that I, I think you need coming off of the bench late in games. Like, the, the Jays just gave away too many at-bats last season with Ernie Clement up or fill-in player X uh, at the plate. I'm not saying like Mancini is a three win player, but there could have been three games where the, the Blue Jays are down late and Mancini comes up with a chance to, to, to break a game open and help you out and get the Jays in a better position. Uh, that, that, that's just, he's the type of talent I would bank on and, and the type of talent I would bet on. And on a minor league deal, I think you absolutely should have done that from a Blue Jays standpoint. So that one was a bit of a miss. Reese Hoskin was, was also one I was hoping the Blue Jays would take a run at. He missed all of last season with the Phillies dealing with injuries. This one, though, the, the, uh, the, the length of the deal, I think it was two years, $38 million. The, the length and the, um, the dollar amount do kind of take it out. Like, I was hoping for a one-year Brandon Belt type of a thing. But to get, like, even one year at the, what was that, be $19 million? One year at 20 for Reese Hoskins, I would do. It's the second year that gives me a bit of pause, given how important the, the next couple of seasons are for the Blue Jays. Um, I, I would kind of want the, the one-year deal there, if I am Toronto. But um, th those are the types of guys that I'd be looking at from a Blue Jays standpoint. So, um, that ends the sports conversation for the day quickly probably not quickly um today is bell let's talk day and that has a lot of meaning to a lot of different people i fully understand that the corporate greed part of this is really really icky and the fact that it's a tax write-off for a giant corporation that um does not treat its employees in a way that would follow the, the mantras provided on, on this bell. Let's talk day is a little disgusting. And uh, a company that has handled layoffs and situations that would create mental health problems. So callously and ineffectively really adds a negative tinge to this whole day. For me personally, this day has always been very important for me. Um, th there have been, Two, I would say, I mean, probably more than two, but on my mental health journey, there were two kind of tentpole events that really helped me turn things around. One was, um, I think it's National Suicide Prevention Week. The uh, Calgary Health Society, uh, or I'm, I'm getting this wrong, um, Calgary Counseling Center, that's who it was. The, the Cal Calgary Counseling Center puts out a... Um, a survey that, that you can fill out. And uh, spoiler alert, it's kind of similar to a survey that you feel um, fill out before every time you go in for a um, uh, a session with, with one of your counselors. Um, so that they give a survey and I, I fill it out. And at the end of it, it says, um, you are at, I, I believe the wording was, it, it's, it's faded on me over the years, you know, it's the head, whatever. But um, basically, I am at serious risk for a major depressive event. Something along those lines. Um, and that can only be one of a couple of things. And as the, the wording goes, none of those are good. Um, and so that was a bit of an eye-opener for me. But then the other one was one of the first Bell Let's Talk days, where you see all of the stories on social media, and you see um, different people sharing different experiences. And it's not just, you know, regular people like me, right? Like it's, it's athletes. Um, another big one was, um, Chester Bennington, the lead singer of, uh, of Lincoln Park, um, taking his own life. That was one where I was like, okay, this stuff doesn't care about status or anything like that. But then to see the, the volume of people with Bell Let's Talk Day was a real like, okay, I can, I can do this. Cause all these people are still here telling their story, right? So obviously not to be glib about it, hasn't got them yet. So like it, it very much is the, um, the, Hey, if you're still here, you're not struggling with depression, depression, struggling with you, uh, tagline that, that a lot of people have used, but, um, that th it was a, a really big moment for me to see just how, for lack of a better term, just how normal this whole thing was and just how not abnormal and fucked up I was for lack of better phrasing, apologize for swearing, but so th this was this was a really really important day for me, and so to to see how Bell has treated employees since and kind of created some of these things is is really frustrating. But for me, it, it is still an important day, and it, it's always going to be a struggle. I, I've talked about this before. Um, I I have seen three different counselors at three three different times for for different reasoning. Um, 
<laughs> one of them was, I just didn't have benefits anymore. So I'm, I'm not going to talk to this person as much. But um, my, my last one, um, in, in chatting with my counselor, one of the last sessions we had, we would go for about like, it was an hour long. Um, but the, the first little bit, you're filling out a thing and just talking about whatever. And the last little bit, it's like, okay, well, here's the bill. Do, 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 do. But normally it would be like 35, 40 minutes of just me going and just trying to basically organize all the thoughts and, and figure everything out. And then, uh, my counselor, Jennifer, what was uh, phenomenal, um, all of, um, Spencer, uh, Becca and, and Jennifer have been amazing to me and completely life-changing. But um, it, it would be a lot of like, the, especially this last time, uh, me trying to like putting out all the puzzle pieces and Jennifer would just kind of be like, okay, well, if you just shift these a little bit, now do you see it? It's like, yes, now I do see it. And we came up with different ways of dealing with things and different um, different methods of helping things out. And different things help different people. I'm not going to say, here are five things to cure your anxiety. Because if, if you do say that, uh, politely, fuck you. Because everyone's different, right? Um, and I understand some people are just trying to help. But um, th there are certain, like, d different things that I was working on. And it was, it was working. They give you a, a score um, after you fill out a survey. Which isn't, like, it's not perfect. But it's just kind of a, a guideline for, for where you're at. And they want you around, I think the number is 63. And I was at about 128 when I started. And then my last one, I was at 59. Which is moving in the right direction. And... Uh, the last one, I, I kind of went for about 5-10 minutes. And then there was a bit of, like, a... Okay, and what else? Almost type of a, a thing. Like it became very apparent, like, okay, this has improved quite a bit. And so Jennifer said, you know, like, I don't, quite frankly, I don't think you need these anymore. You, you have the tools to use. You, you just have to use them. Um, not that, like, I've beat therapy or anything like that, because it, it is still an invaluable tool. And it's probably something I should do more. But I took that as like, okay, I have I have passed this level. It is now on to, to just the me part. And that's great when everything is going fine. But if for whatever reason, a uh, cat wakes you up and you only get four hours of sleep instead of eight, those things tend to, to fall behind. And so that, that to me is always the message around these, is that this is, it's like Mauro Ranallo said in his uh, documentary, the, the Bipolar Rock and Roller. This is, it, it's a, a life sentence, but it doesn't have to be a death sentence. This is something I am just going to deal with for the rest of my life. And I have um, amazing support around me and amazing people who have given me the tools to deal with this stuff. It's just kind of on me now to, to use those. And sometimes I slip on them and it takes me a little bit to get back on track. And sometimes I use different things as like, oh, well, this will actually fix it. And no, it's not. It's, it's for me, it's constant meditation. It's, it's focusing on breath work. It's focusing on proper diet and exercise. Um, all those really annoying things that actually do work. Um, but it, it's also recognizing how I am talking to myself internally. Uh, Cause that voice inside your head, is a real difficult one to shut off, right? And if it's the, the one that you're hearing the most, uh, it, it's really difficult when it's not nice to you. And so recognizing that and flipping it make things a, a whole, 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 whole lot better, for me anyway. Um, for, for some people, it requires medication, and there is nothing wrong with that as well. But the, the thing that I, I always caution on, on these days and any day I talk about this, there is no cut finish line. I have beat anxiety. It's not going to be... Okay, well, I, I got this promotion. I got this money. I got this job. I cut this person out. All that stuff absolutely 100% helps. I would much rather be dealing with everything I'm dealing with while being a billionaire uh, than I am uh, someone who is trying to make a living talking about sports on the internet, right? Like, that, it, 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 it becomes easier, but it's not the perfect pill for things, right? Like, th there is still a lot of work that goes into it. See, professional athletes, DeMar DeRozan, Kevin Love, Michael Phelps, um famous musicians who didn't make it, right? Like Chris Cornell, um, Chester Bennington, as, as I said before. This shit doesn't care about your status. It, regardless of how you are doing or what house you have, This, it, it, if it's got you, it's got you. And it's got you forever, but there's ways that you can deal with it and there's ways for you to, to fight back against it. So don't think that getting this promotion will be the thing. Um, getting the, this whatever, finding this person, all, all of these sorts of things will help initially. But the the day-to-day the -day stuff is always going to be there. And the last thing I would say is, and again, take this for for, for whatever you want, right? Like I'm, I am, I'm in the midst of it. I'm certainly not an expert. And I, I probably am currently at a point where I struggle with it more than I don't. 
And that has become really, really frustrating. And that's, that is a level of this that I didn't understand, or I, I didn't anticipate, is that you think like, okay, I, my, my, my counselor has told me that I have now passed this part. So to me, that's the progress that I need and I, I, I shouldn't be going back. And now I'm probably at the point where I should be back and I'm not. And part of that is being stubborn because I've, I've beaten this. How, how, how could I possibly go back? This would be admitting defeat and all of those, you know, bullshit things that people tell themselves all the time. But um, the, the one other thing I would say that I have learned in the last little while is fight for yourself. Um, I, in one of my last sessions with, with my counselor, um, she said, you know, I, I, I don't diagnose people, but I am about as sure as I can be. You have ADHD. And so I was like, okay, well, like, and you start to start to analyze how you go through your day. It's like, well, that does seem like I check a lot of these boxes and it has been an absolute fight to try to get anything that would help me with that. Um, I have been told that the recommendation I have, um, is not worthy and I need to go through another independent thing that will be remarkably expensive and be a, a real detriment to, uh, <laughs> to, to my financial well-being. which, but, and then if they come around and say, ah, no, don't really believe you. It's like, can I, like, and I understand you can't just be like, I need these pills, fix it because that has fallen a lot of people down the wrong path in the, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, but it's been really, really frustrating to to be going through this process and to know that there is something that probably, again, I don't want to use the word fix, but there is something that would absolutely help with a lot of these things. And I have to scratch and claw to get any type of anything to, to help this out. And so that has been the, the next step for me is recognizing how I do have to fight for myself. Sometimes I have to, um, it feels like I'm fighting myself in general with the, the internal struggle that goes on up in this head here. Um, but absolutely fight for yourself because you are worth it. And that is the, the last message I have on that. Um, okay, that is the show. Thank you all so much. This is a bit of a long one. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in today. Remember, rate, review, subscribe wherever you can. Um, leave a nice review in the podcast world. If you are watching this, um, thank you. Like this video, subscribe to the channel, and follow me on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. I'm at primetimeklein, twitch.tv slash primetimepk, and you can email the show, Couch Potato Diary at yahoo.com. We got more pro wrestling coming up tomorrow as we get ready for the Royal Rumble uh, this weekend. And then Friday's the big show. We're pre uh, previewing the Royal Rumble. We are previewing the week coming up in the NFL. It's going to be a big Fights and Football Friday. I thank you all so much for tuning in today, and I will talk to all of you later. <laughs>